Oh, hi there. We were just reading this uh, guide to Victorian children's books, Juvenile Literature As It Is, published in 1888. Oh, but before I tell you about it, you don't even know where we are. Welcome to the bookman's crib. Let's take a look inside. So one of the interesting things in this book is that it's got what's probably the first ever reader's poll completed by children, answering the questions, who's your favourite author and what's your favourite book? And whether it was boys or girls, regardless of their gender, they both answered that in 1888, their favourite author was Charles Dickens. Well, we can congratulate them on having good taste, but were they actually reading children's literature? Ask yourself this question. What novels did Dickens write that were specifically for children? Tough one, isn't it? Well, the only two books that Dickens wrote specifically for children were Child's History of England, published in Household Words in the 1850s, and The Life of Our Lord, which Dickens wrote for his own children and wasn't published until 1934. And I'd say that those two books are probably the least popular of all of Dickens's works. The only other thing that I can think of is a short piece called Holiday Romance, which Dickens wrote for money um, and to order in America and was published in an American journal during his tour in the late 1860s. Other than that, Dickens's novels were written for and intended for adults. Nonetheless, he was the children's favourite author in the 1880s. But if we have another look at this list, Dickens comes top of it, but second in the list is W.H.G. Kingston. Who? W.H.G. Kingston. Well, if you've heard of him, thumbs up to you. If you can name one of his books, a big gold star. Well, during this talk, we're going to find out something about W.H.G. Kingston and why we don't hear about him anymore, even though he was the second most popular children's author during the late 19th century. Come on, Edric, let's go on a little walk. Well, in the last video, I asked you to choose which door we open next. One, two, or three. Number one is the shower room. Number two is for number twos. Sorry about that. But if we open number three, we carry on in our odyssey round the bookman's crib. Come inside. It's small and cramped, but full of goodies. Take a look around. In this room, there are collections of H.G. Wells, D.H. Lawrence, Somerset Maugham, Bret Hart, William Faulkner, Mary Corelli, R.M. Ballantyne, Robert Louis Stevenson, and W.H.G. Kingston. Well, take a look at these beauties. This is one of the world's best collections of the works of W.H.G. Kingston. Uh, Kingston was born in London in 1814, making him just a couple of years younger than Dickens. Uh, the early part of his career was spent in the port wine trade, uh, going to and fro between London and Porto, and he was even awarded a knighthood for his services to trade between Britain and Portugal by the Portuguese court. Uh, he started writing fiction in the 1840s, mostly uh, novels for adults, which weren't terribly successful, but his breakthrough came in 1851 with the publication of Peter the Whaler, the novel uh, with which his name was associated throughout the rest of his life. And this is a boy's adventure story, uh, a lot of it set in the Arctic wastes, a story of uh, shipwreck and survival, very common theme in Kingston's works. So the basic format of a Kingston novel is that a young male hero goes off to have adventures either on land or at sea, usually gets shipwrecked, um, but everything turns out all right in the end. Uh, Say so he produced over 160 books in 40 years. His peak of productivity was 1874 when he published 15 books. As well as novels, Kingston produced a history of the British Navy, biographies of Captain Cook and various African explorers, and books about animals and guides to emigration. 
He produced a novel in 1850 called How to Emigrate, which deals with the subject of how to emigrate to Australia, and it came out in the same year as Dickens's David Copperfield, at the end of which roughly half of the surviving characters emigrate to Australia. Now, without delving too deeply into the politically incorrect ideology which underpins most of Kingston's writing, we can enjoy looking at some beautiful examples of mid to late Victorian book production. This is one of my favourites. It's entitled At the South Pole, and we'd have to classify it as science fiction since it was published in 1870 and nobody got to the South Pole for another 40 years. And uh, since Kingston was imagining what you'd find there, guess what he found? Polar bears at the South Pole, which according to his uh, description are twice as large as the polar bears at the North Pole. Bizarrely, even though Kingston wrote such a huge number of books and made very little money from them, he's best remembered in connection with books he didn't write, the English translations of several of Jules Verne's novels. On the title pages we can find Kingston's name as the translator. However, this was rather devious as Kingston was used as a brand name since the books were actually translated by Mrs. W. H. G. Kingston, the author's wife Agnes, as became apparent after Kingston himself died and new translations continued to appear. Kingston died of cancer in 1880, looking very much like Dickens might have done if he'd lived for another ten years. Actually, Kingston's posthumous popularity far exceeded that during his lifetime, and his books continued to be reprinted and sold in the tens of thousands down to the end of the First World War. After that, however, tastes changed, and Kingston was dropped as reactionary, old-fashioned, simply Victorian. Boys now wanted stories with aeroplanes, car chases, robbers and murderers, and Kingston's name was gradually forgotten. Now, I'm not trying to start a Kingston revival, and he's not even a very good stylist. The problem is that Kingston's ideology is completely unacceptable to 21st century sensibilities. Fortunately for us, Dickens didn't choose to set any of his novels in darkest Africa or the British Raj in India, and Dickens's morality is fairly straightforward. Good triumphs in the end, and we're left with the feeling that harmony has been restored at the end of a Dickens novel. Dickens and Kingston. There's so much more I wanted to talk about. I wanted to tell you about Ballantyne, Robert Louis Stevenson. <laughs> George Manville Fenn. <laughs> Once again, you can choose where we go next. We can stay in here, room three, go back to room four, move on to room five, or even room six. See you next time. In the white room with black curtains near the station.